Hey, welcome everyone who's coming in. Um, feel free to drop in the chat where you're from. Um, what's the weather like today? How are you doing? Just let us know and make sure it's to all panelists and attendees because everyone else wants to see how you are. Wow, loads and loads of people. Ooh, Nina's from Switzerland. Hi. Ooh. One more. Um, I'm in the UK. Nice and sunny for a change today. Ooh, Sidel's from Vermont. Kirsten from Hanover. Regina from Dessau. Slovakia. Belarus. Oh, hi, Christina. You'll probably enjoy some of this. <laughs> Hamburg, Germany, Colombia, Berlin. Germany, Germany, Mannheim, that's cool. Luxembourg, very nice. Bonn, oh, I love Bonn. France, Italy, Portugal, Czech Republic, hi Martin. Oh, Basque country, that's very cool as well. Lots of people from Berlin, love Berlin. Hey, Jin Young, hi Jin Young, from South Korea, Cologne. Oh, someone else from London. Hi, Emily. Oh, yes, Emily. <laughs> so, Dusseldorf, Switzerland. From Germany, but in Mexico, Gina. Oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to just get my screen shared so we can get started. Okay. Oh, I need to lean up for a sec. <laughs> Ducks, um, the chat again. Oh, go back. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try and keep an eye on the chat, but it's gonna be kind of difficult. There's a lot going on. Yes, uh, Randolph just said I'm harmless. My name looks Irish. It does, but you'll notice from my accent, sadly, I'm not. Um, Okay, so um, but I will introduce myself now. I think we've got most people in probably. Um, so my name is Charlotte. I'm coming to you from Utalk, which is a company that makes a language learning app where you can learn at the minute 145 languages from about 100 or so of our languages. So you don't just have to speak English or German to use it, which is pretty cool. And because we have so many languages, we are now focusing a lot of our effort on either varieties of mainstream languages or on indigenous, regional or minority languages. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today are some endangered languages that are in Europe, because that's kind of a cool thing to look at. So if you were at Expo Lingo in November, I did a talk about that then, but we looked at some different languages, so we get some new ones today. Um, so what we're going to be talking about, first of all, endangered languages around the world then endangered languages in Europe. So again, if you did come to the talk last time, these slides are going to be pretty similar, but um, you know, it's fine. <laughs> then we'll take a better look at Irish, Ladino and Belarusian. So if you didn't know anything about them at the beginning, you should have a bit more of an idea after we're done. And then we're going to do a very, very, very quick quiz so that you can have a little bit of fun um, and we'll give away some coins for our app as well. So you can give that a try if you want to. So um, in a worldwide context, we have six to 7,000 languages in the world. Obviously we don't know an exact number, but that's what we estimate. Then 45% of these are what UNESCO says are endangered, around 2,600. And these figures are actually from about 10 years ago. So we're hoping to see some updated figures soon, but it's not super optimistic that they'll be any better by then. And just so that you have um, this kind of context as well, because I'm going to talk about it, there are five levels of endangerment that are about how languages are passed on and how linguists kind of know when a language is going to start dying out. So these are safe or not enough data, which is pretty clear. Vulnerable, which is when a language is restricted in its use, so it might only be used at home or it might only be taught in school. It's kind of restricted to one or more domains. Definitely endangered is when children stop learning a language. Um, so parents and grandparents still speak it, but children are kind of stopping learning it. Severely endangered, um, parents 
probably know it well enough to communicate with grandparents but don't really speak it and don't pass it on to their kids and critically endangered is classed as when speakers are of the grandparents generation and older um again this doesn't apply exclusively to every language it's not a very very exact criteria um, because there are some languages like Manx that is very endangered but actually the vast majority of speakers are quite young because it's going through revival efforts so it doesn't apply to everything but it's it's kind of a general criteria we can use to know what's going on with these languages and then we have two countries here India and the USA and these have the most endangered languages for a country um, anywhere in the world so India has 196 and as you see on our map here we got lots of these tiny little maxes, um, which means that there's a lot of languages there that actually are endangered but have a high number of native speakers. So this map represents the top 51 languages by number of um, native speakers that are endangered. So there's a lot of them in the north and northeast that are endangered but are still spoken by an awful lot of people. Um, however, if we look at the USA, which has 192 endangered languages, we actually have this one max and he's not even representing an indigenous American language, he's representing Yiddish. So we can see then a massive difference that is down to the context in which these languages became endangered um, because both are kind of results of lots of different aspects. Um, America definitely of colonialism and native languages being wiped out. And in India, colonialism through the rise of English, but also the rise of Hindi has forced out some of these languages or is slowly pushing them out. Um, okay, so then we go to Europe. Um, again, a lot of these figures are from the EU they're last year or earlier so they don't discount the fact that the UK has kind of left now but they're still fairly accurate I would say so I'm still going to go with these. Um, so there are 221 endangered languages in the EU according to their figures. Um, obviously the EU has its 24 working languages as well and it also recognises 60 or more indigenous regional and minority languages but just because the EU recognises them, it doesn't mean that much for those languages in their national context because it is up to a national government to um, push revival efforts if they want to do that or to lend support in whatever way they can. Um, and then on our app, we have 12 endangered European languages, um, including the three we're looking at today, which are Irish, Ladino and Belarusian. So Irish, we've got a nice picture of Sunny Island. Um, so Ireland, uh, Irish is considered to be definitely endangered, um, so it is in a lot of danger there. It's a Celtic language, and if we have the Celtic languages here, then there are two branches that come off from it, and one is Goidelic and one is Britonic. And Irish is over here with the Goidelic languages, along with Scottish, Gaelic and Manx. And then on the other side, we have Welsh, Cornish and Breton are the Britonic languages. I'm pretty sure all of these languages are endangered, but we're obviously looking at Irish today. So we're going to do a quick run through the history of the Irish language um, before we talk about how it's doing right now. So it actually has the oldest written vernacular in Western Europe of any Western European language because there are inscriptions in the Ogham alphabet from the fourth century. Um, so these are on stone and they're like little lines that were used to represent different letters. Um, and there were some different languages mixed in but Irish is the oldest one represented there. And this is what we call primitive Irish, uh, which through the fifth century developed into old Irish. And then in the sixth century, they were using the Latin alphabet for this. So it was quite kind of a quick transition as far as languages go for um, to switch from one alphabet to the other. And then we sort of move through into Middle Irish in the 10th century. Um, and this is spoken not just in Ireland at this point, but also in Scotland and on the Isle of Man, because Irish people started to move around and move to these places. And then what we see over the next 200 years is the development of this Goidelic branch of languages that split from Middle Irish. So Middle Irish then becomes Irish in Ireland, so early modern, then modern Irish. Then it becomes Scottish Gaelic in Scotland. And then in, on the Isle of Man, it actually mixes a little bit with Old Norse in some of the place names and things and becomes Manx. So by the 17th century, we have modern Irish. Um, obviously a little bit different to the Irish spoken today, but it's the same continuum of a language. But what we also see as we get into the 17th century and the 18th century particularly, is language shift. Um, so from the east of Ireland, so close to the closest part to the UK, um, the Irish language just really began to lose ground um, very quickly. And 
there's lots of very, very complex reasons why we get language shift, but ultimately three main ones in the case of Irish um, are that it was discouraged to be used by the um, Anglo-Britain administration that came over from England and took Ireland. They wanted everyone to speak English. The Catholic Church also discouraged the use of Irish instead of English. They wanted to do sermons and things in English. And where it applied, the Protestant Church did the same thing. Um, they were a little bit more lenient with Irish, but still generally delivered everything in English. And from 1750, the spread of bilingualism, um, lots of Irish people were going to America, lots of them were coming to England and moving to other places, and so they were learning English. And so with all these, especially these external pressures of everyone has to speak it, it becomes very difficult to hold on to this language. So by the first half of the 19th century, there were still around three million Irish speakers. And it's not like they didn't know this was happening because at the end of the century, we see the launch of the Gaelic um, revival movement, which was to encourage people to learn and use the language. But this has probably helped, but it's not stopped the language from sort of becoming more endangered because now there are estimated to only be around 170,000 first language Irish speakers. So these are people who have learned it as their native language, most likely, yes, alongside English now, but also use it regularly um, and can use it as well as they use, say, English. However, 1.6 million people in Ireland claim some proficiency with the language and we don't actually have figures outside of Ireland. So we can probably guess that or assume that there's a significant enclave of people who speak Irish or are learning Irish in North America, for example, in Canada and in the USA, because lots of Irish people emigrated there. And we can assume as well in the rest of the UK, there's plenty of people that probably do know some Irish. So we can assume that number's a little bit higher than it is, but it's still not great because these are people that will be surrounded by other more dominant languages. And um, there's just two things here that give us some examples of that. Um, so No Biela is a documentary series that aired, I think in 2008, um, and an Irish TV presenter went around Dublin and he tried to conduct his everyday business in Irish and basically found it impossible to do that. Um, so it was quite pessimistic, I guess. It's quite a fun program. You can watch it on YouTube um, as far as I know. But he found that in Dublin, in like urban centres, it's quite difficult to use Irish, um, not just because people aren't learning Irish, but because there's a lot of people who aren't Irish who live there. But when you get to the Gaeltacht area, which is this area of Western Ireland, um, so places like Donegal, Galway, Cork, Kerry, these are the areas where Irish still kind of thrives. So these are the areas where you get so, still some first language speakers. Um, and the issue we have now, and um, what we're hoping we'll find out in the next year or so, because I think Ireland should be doing a census this year like we did, um, is the number of speakers here, because if it drops below two thirds of people speaking Irish here on a regular basis, then that really does signal that Irish is losing even more ground now than it was before. So hopefully Irish is doing better than we think it is. There's definitely a lot more people interested in learning it now. Um, it's got a lot of kind of prestige as a language. A lot of people consider it their heritage language, but we're not certain what the future of Irish is gonna be. But to help with some learning it, we're gonna do some little Irish words. So even though um, I can't, hear you, it would be cool if you'd say them. Um, so the first one is hello. Diachut. 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 So yeah, Charlo's written that in the chat there. And then thank you. Goramahagat. Goramahagat. Goramahagat, which is thank you. Um, and someone's asked, do um, Irish people learn Irish in schools. Um, yeah, they do. And this is um, another issue that, um, again, people learn it in school, but they're not really using it outside of school. And also people are worried that it will create a class of people who are well educated and do know Irish because they have access to Irish education in Irish, but don't necessarily use it. And you need to really get to those people that are going to use it in their everyday life. So you need to build a community of it and that's not really working through schools like everyone who goes to a publicly funded school in Ireland has to take Irish lessons but it's not always working out super well but yeah so we have Diochit and Goramahagit so you can now say hello and thank you when you go to Galway okay 
We will move on to Ladino now. Um, Ladino is a severely endangered language. Um, yeah, and basically its history starts around the time of the Alhambra decree, decree, which was 1492. It's also called the Edict of Expulsion. And what this was, was the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, which is basically where Spain is now, um, decreed that they were expelling all the Jews from this area. This in itself wasn't very uncommon for the time. Lots of European countries every so often would expel all the Jews, they would seize all their property and assets, and then after a period of time would allow them to return. The Alhambra decree was interesting and devastating for these people in that it was the first time blood purity laws had been enacted, and therefore they, they were not allowed to return afterwards and they had to scatter. And these people, so these Sephardic Jews, went to places like Portugal, um, like Morocco and particularly the Ottoman Empire, so Turkey and Greece area, um, and that's where they started to live. And so it's unlikely that Ladino existed as an entirely separate language before 1492 because Sephardic Jews who lived in these regions would be speaking Old Spanish because that's what the people around them were speaking. And then we can also see from the other influences that it is a language that arose very much out of the environment in which they found themselves. So some of the influences on Ladino have been things like Turkish, Hebrew, French, Italian, other Baltic languages. Um, there's even a Moroccan dialect of Ladino. So there is Ladino and then a, a very specific dialect spoken in Morocco. Um, and for a while the language did very well. It was a big trade language. It was the main language of Thessaloniki in Greece um, for a very long time. And the decline then began a few hundred years later, before the 20th century, um, where people just sort of stopped using the language, and part of this was due to education. Um, the children were taught in the national languages of the country, so if they were in France, they were taught in French, for example, and part of it was the language was kind of seen as a relic of their grandparents' generation as they're learning their national languages. But then with the 20th century comes this wave of nationalism and of anti-Semitism, and it's suddenly also dangerous to be speaking Ladino for these people. So it's not just like, oh, our grandparents speak it, we don't want to. It's that if we come from a Ladino speaking household and we're speaking Greek, we still have this accent and people will know we're Jewish. And then obviously World War II and the Holocaust, this is already a small group of people, a small number of speakers that are scattered around the world and many of them were murdered. So our small number becomes even smaller and the language is coming close to dying out. And so now most of the speakers are elderly. Many of them obviously live in Israel. Um, many also do live in the United States. Um, so both of the speakers on our app live in the United States. One was from, born and raised in New York City. The other is from Turkey and she lives in the US now. Um, and it's sort of, it's still surviving, it's still going on. Um, lots of young people or younger people are getting involved in um, the music of Ladino. So either older music or making up their own music and singing in Ladino as part of their heritage. And interestingly, um, coronavirus has had an impact on the language, a positive impact in that they're having Zoom classes in Ladino. So this is an article I found on forward.com. So if you go in there and look for it, you'll find it. Um, and basically they found that hundreds of people wanted to go to Zoom classes in Ladino because the other issue you have when your speakers are scattered is how do you come together and teach a language? And it's only been since the rise of the internet and technology that this has even really been a possibility. Um, so there's been a history, a long history of like message boards and things for people who speak Ladino and for the Sephardic Jews, but now, they can use Zoom because we all know how to use Zoom now. Um, and yeah, it's not just Jewish people learning it either. It's um, a whole load of different people that are interested in Ladino. But this one really just highlights a language that's not only becoming closer to dying out, but also has been entirely forgotten as a mainstream language, even though it was such a big one for a really long time. But hopefully things are looking more positive for this one, at least. So um, if you speak Spanish, this is going to be fairly easy for you. Uh, to say hello in Ladino, you say... Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. So pretty easy one if you speak some Spanish. 
And you're welcome. No hay por cualo. No hay por cualo. No hay por cualo. So you say hello and you're welcome. Um, and interestingly, obviously, we see Ladino written in um, the Latin script now in Latin alphabet, but they do have their own script. They can also write it in their Rashi script, like Hebrew, but they have their own script called Solitreo, which is a um, very cool thing to look up when you have a minute, because um, not many people use it anymore, but it's just very pretty, very nice. So our final language is Belarusian. Um, and the interesting case of Belarusian is that it's a vulnerable language that is also a national language. Um, and we start with, was going to start with modern Belarusian in the 19th century that rose out of the Ruthian languages of that region. Um, and for a while there, it was fighting against um, Russian and Polish for dominance because um, the Russian Empire was trying to sort of take over this area, Poland's trying to take over this area, and they're both trying to force their language on the people there. And what they realized at one point was that actually this peasant class speaking this language that we don't understand is quite large and they are going to actually decide the outcome of any situation. And so then they started to appeal to these people speaking Belarusian. And this was so effective that by 1897, in the Russian Empire census, people were declaring themselves as Belarusian for the first time, um, which is significant because they're in the Russian Empire, and yet they still have come to this national identity because it's kind of working out for everyone. Um, and so we get the first wave of this here, and then sort of socialism comes in, and for the language it was actually quite good because it kind of promotes these languages that are seen as rural or uneducated languages as the languages of the people um, and so people start to really take it seriously the first grammars are written down which is just just a way of legitimizing a language really but then post world war ii um, with the soviet union we see this era of russification which is part of the issue that's arisen in belarus today um, is that russia's really taking over this area <clears throat> so, even though Belarusian is ostensibly a national language of Belarus, schools are teaching in Russian, administrative, administrative details are done in Russian, everything's kind of happening in Russian. To the point where in 1955, 1956, 5% um, of schools in Belarus taught in Belarusian, the rest taught in Russian. Um, as of 2016, I saw a thing that said, there were no universities that basically only taught in Belarusian, most of them taught in Russian or obviously international ones in English. And so it's really an odd case where it's a national language that is not used nationally because this other language is coming in and trying to push it out. Um, and so the change here has had to come obviously from the people who speak it, um, which is where all change comes from, but it's a very interesting way it's come about here. One way is group classes, and I don't mean group classes like a group of people sitting in a classroom like a normal class. I mean people packed into cafes to learn the language that they should be speaking or they feel they should be speaking um, or trying to improve it. And it's building that community around the language, which is what language is for. It's for building a community. So these group classes and they're free um, and they're run by an organisation um, across Belarus. Um, so that's one way that it's sort of looking up. The second is advertising, which is a really interesting one because it's not really for promoting the language in many cases. So people are advertising to people who speak Belarusian because they have money and they're advertising a product and saying this product will help you, please buy it. But what this does is it legitimizes a language for someone else. So if you are on the outside looking in and there's plenty of people who think of Belarusian as it's not an important language but if you see companies advertising to those people and using that language it then legitimizes it for these outsiders which doesn't seem like it should be important but it is because that's the point of changing the perspective so hopefully more of these efforts will help with the language at least obviously there's a lot of other things going on and then for music um i found something interesting and fun that combines music and also digital technology, the internet, what we're finding is helping endangered languages a lot nowadays. Um, and it's a song. So if anyone's um, been on Netflix and seen The Witcher, then you will know the song 
toss a coin to your witcher which when i was on youtube i found that there's a belarusian version from this folk rock band um whose name i can't pronounce in belarusian but translates as the local nobility so they've been around since 1992 and it seems like a lot of what they do now they do their own songs but also do some covers of some very popular um up-to-date songs so this is quite a fun way that it's promoting the language it's saying like look we're cool we're up to date which the you are your people that exist speaking belarusian here and now and you know it's very memey and very catchy and it's a very fun song to listen to in belarusian um if you just google it um i've put the link there but if you just look on youtube you can find it so hopefully more and more people internationally will come to understand belarusian and speak it more and we'll do a couple of words here as well so first we have hello Privitanya. Privitanya. so we have privitanya for hello and then goodbye da pabacenya da pabacenya da pabacenya it's really cute i like that one um so yeah so that's belarusian so um it's time for a little quiz so um get ready you can put your answer in the chat that's fine just keep track of if you got them right or wrong um if you got them all right you can send me an email um and we'll give you some coins so you can try out the app we've got some other stuff at the end as well that you can try out so are we all ready for a quiz yes or no yes arisha's ready and yes Okay, we've only got three questions. It's gonna be real quick. Don't worry about that. So, ready. How many endangered languages are there in Europe? So what's that number I gave you at the beginning? Is it A, 183, B, 221, C, 245, or D, 260? Okay, we've got lots of them coming in. To, to, to give you about five more seconds. Three, two, one. It is B. Congratulations to everyone paying attention to a lot of maths there. Okay. So listen up for this one. This is not a word that you've just heard, but it is one of the languages you've just heard. Although I've just given away my dead answer, but it's fine. Which language is this? And Tam Rog. Okay, is it A Belarusian, B Ladino, C Irish, or D Danish? I'll just play it again in case you missed it. And Tam Rog. Okay, I think we've got this one. Okay, give me three, two, one. It's Irish. And in case you're wondering what it is. And Tamrog. It's a shamrock. So um, we have a little section for each of our languages where you get some culturally specific words. Um, and we have shamrock in there for Irish because it's a symbol. And then how do you say hello in Ladino? Uh, do you say A, Guten Tag, B, Privitania, C, Buenas Tardes, or D, Buenos Dias? Okay. Lots and lots of answers. A few more seconds. Okay, three, two, one. Is Buenos Dias. So yeah, that's it. Um, we've got a couple of offers on, um, so you can get our UTalk staff pack if you go to uta.lk slash expo lingua dash spring 21. Emily's put that in the chat for you. Uh, you get eight free topics and you can pick any language. So you can try out whatever we've got. And we've also done a raffle. Um, so if you go to uta.lk slash expo lingua dash raffle and put in your email address, you can win one of three lifetime access codes. So you get all of our languages, um, even if we add more basically. Um, so yeah, thank you. If there are any questions, I am very happy to take those. I think we've got a couple minutes left. 
So um, I'll just scroll down. So I've got one. Do you offer Rater Romance? We do not. Um, if you email me though and tell me about it, we can look into it a little bit, um, but we don't have that yet. Um, can you explain the different types of endangered again, please? So um, yeah, let me just go back so I can actually see the levels because I always get them in the wrong order. <laughs> um, oh, we're going way back I'm just gonna escape out of that. So vulnerable um, comes after safe. And this is when um, it's not used, for example, at home or at school. Um, definitely endangered is when children don't use it. Basically, severely endangered is when children and parents don't really use it. And critically endangered is when it's only grandparents and older is a really easy way to remember it. But there's a lot of nuance and complexity involved in it. But that's the basic way of doing it. Uh, Sophia, which is your favourite? <laughs> yeah, if I knew. Um, <laughs> I've, out of these three, the only one I've tried to learn a little bit of it is Irish and I find it very hard to pronounce. I think I'd probably like to learn Ladino the most because I don't find Spanish that hard. Um, but Belarusian is very cool. I like the way it sounds. Um, it's a lot of fun. Thanks for that question, Sophia. Uh, what about Plattdeutsch? We don't have that either and I really want it. Um, I also really want like Austrian, uh, German and stuff, but we have um, Swiss German, we do have, um, and we have Luxembourgish as well. Um, there's also a Ladino in Switzerland, is it the same as your presentation? No, I think Charlo put some links in the chat earlier. So there's the L Ladin language and Ladino, but Ladino itself as a name comes from a word that was kind of used for most languages um, before it was its own language. So, yeah, it's not the same language, but they are, they're all kind of romance languages. Uh, which kind of Swiss German? Oh, I can't remember if it's Zurich or Bern. I can't remember, it's on our website, Nina. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's definitely one over the other because we had people ask that before. Um, Ulrika said it's not so hard to learn Ladino, you have to keep in mind it's an offshoot from Middle Spanish. Yeah, if you speak some Spanish, um, it's pretty, pretty easy to follow. Um, but yeah, I think we are a little bit over time now. So thank you so much everyone for coming today. Um, yeah, if you have any more questions or anything, just feel free to email me. I know the light's kind of on my name there, but yeah, it's just charlotte at utalk.com. Um, so yeah, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of Expo Lingua. <laughs>